Okay, let's get started. Uh, before we begin, um, Stacy Spire is going to say a few words uh, about our local organization here at BAM. Stacy. Hello, my name is Stacy Spire. I am an artist who's been making math art and studying mathematics for over 10 years. Um, we're so glad that you could join us today for this BAM meeting. BAM stands for Bay Area Artists and Mathematicians. We're a group that gets together to talk about different areas of art and math, share presentations, do some show and tell. It's kind of an informal bridges or gathering for Gardner. Um, let's see, I've been helping to organize it for the last year along with Scott Forthman and Frank Ferris. It was Vince Matsko who started this version of our group, but before that, um, the octahedral group used to meet to share mathematical experiences, and that group was led by Vi Hart, Andrea Hoxley, and Gwen Fisher. Um, we're really glad that the structure of BAM was here to facilitate this memorial for John Conway. Um, we're so excited that all of you could be here today, and I just have to say it, it means a lot to me to um, be able to honor such an amazing person who develops so much math that, um, that I care about. Thank you so much for being here, and I look forward to hearing what you all have to say. Thank you, Stacy. So, welcome everyone to the special BAM session to share memories of John Conway. I'm your host, uh, Bob Hearn, today. Um, and in addition to Stacy, uh, Scott Wortman will be moderating and uh, Frank Ferris is doing the, the Zoom hosting for us today. So, wow, is, is all I can say. I am overwhelmed with the group of speakers that we've managed to put together for, for, for this session. This, this just sort of snowballed from uh, an idea uh, from Carl Schaefer, why don't we share Conway memories at our, at our next meeting to, uh, to uh, this in, incredible set of speakers. And um, I, think it's, I think it's going to be uh, a valuable historical record, actually, we're going to save it and, and share it. And uh, I, I have to say it's a little bit ironic. You know, we lost John to the coronavirus, um, and yet it's because of the coronavirus that all of us are now accustomed to meeting like this. And under other circumstances, I just don't think we would be able to to put this, this group of speakers together. So um, to kick things off, let me just say I'm, I'm wearing this, uh, this Escher shirt here today in honor of John. Um, it's my understanding this was one of his favorite shirts, uh, that he had several copies of this shirt, uh, that he had this exact shirt and he wore it until it dissolved, and then he got another one and wore it until he dissolved, and a third one. And then he couldn't get them anymore. So every time I would see him at Gathering for Gardener or a um, combinatorial game theory workshop, he would always say, Bob, you've got that shirt. I need that shirt. So um, that's my, my brief uh, memory of, of John. I didn't know him as well as many of you did. Um, so I'm going to be moderating. Scott Bortman will be moderating as well. And um, Scott, would you like to say a word or two? Thank you, Bob. Yeah, so I'm Scott Worthman. Um, I feel so privileged to be amongst you all. Uh, this is an amazing event, and uh, we, all, we all owe Bob a, a big thank you for um, all the organizing he's done. Um, it's just it's wonderful to see you all here and uh, to help us remember John Conway and all his contributions and the way he's touched us. So with that, I think we should um, turn things over to our first speaker. Um, we probably won't be able to do introductions for everyone, but uh, Siobhan Roberts, um, you may, many of you probably know, uh, is the bi biographer of John Conway. Um, I can recommend, recommend the book highly. So Siobhan, we're going to give you the floor. Great, thank you very much, Scott, and thank you, Bob, and everyone for organizing this magnificent gathering. Um, I, where to start, really? I mean, I'm sure for many of you, um, but I would say one thing that I've been thinking over this the past two weeks is that John was obviously a, um, a biographer's, this biographer's um, dream come true and worst nightmare in a couple of ways. Um, he was just so incredibly generous with his time. Um, I spent countless hours with him at Princeton um, and he's, he's such a great storyteller and he, he told me story upon story and um, the book would not be what it 
what it is without um, John's extreme generosity. Um, and it would be a pale, a pale civilly if, if he was not present so much in the book and he sort of talked so much that he got his own font, which just made it a lot of, lot of fun from start to finish. Um, on the downside, he was kind of congenitally incapable of answering a yes or no question, um, which made it difficult to fact check in the end stages. Um, so, you know, I'd ask him a question, you know, about the surreal numbers. Did you, you know, think about this that way or, you know, some specific thing. And he's like, well, did I ever tell you the story about when Don Knuth came to visit? And I'm just like, yes, John, I've got all the stories. Like, I just need <laughs> to zero in on this specific detail. Um, but, you know, all in all, it was it was a wonderful process. And And certainly when I was faced with writing his obituary, it was a bit awkward because of course, by the end of it, he was a good friend. He was not just um, my subject. And he, I, I looked back and found an old email, if you could believe it, from, from John. And he signed off, your loyal subject, Jay. So he was um, totally uh, uh, embedded in the process as well. But um, I found myself having to page through the book to remind myself of all the wonderful, wonderful gems and really found myself newly agog at just all the the wonderments or wondermentalia that he both bestowed and inflicted um, on me. And it was just such a delight to go back through. And I think one of the highlights um, in our, you know, almost 10 years uh, together researching the book was a trip to Cambridge for research with Gareth, his 10 year old, and we played games with his um, four wonderful daughters, um, Annie, Ellie, Susie, and Rosie. Um, and Annie recently remarked that, you know, growing up with her dad was like fireworks every day. Like you just did not know what to expect. Um, and that was very much my experience. And I thought I'd just finish um, with one of the, the small delights that he um, bestowed upon me. Uh, it wasn't the last visit, but it was um, the second last visit. I made some kind of, you know, banal comment about, oh, time flies. And he came back with, time flies like an arrow fruit flies like a banana. And that was just so John, you know, it's just kind of like this delightful bon mot or gem that kind of sets you off. And I've repeated that so many times since then. So uh, in closing, I, I look forward to hearing um, many new stories from everybody and also being reminded of, of stories that I've no doubt heard already, but you know, I always love hearing them again. Thank you so much, Siobhan. Um, Next up, we have Pete Winkler. Hopefully, Pete is ready. I am. Um, yeah, I've had uh, many delightful conversations with John, um, most recently about puzzles or about free will. Um, but I'd like to, to uh, give you one short, but I think typical anecdote. So it is, now, it is uh, September 28th, 2006, which John would instantly tell you was a Thursday. I was giving a talk at uh, Princeton and about uh, stacking bricks so as to uh, lean over the edge of a table. And in response to a question, I explained that um, you can extend the overhang slightly by twisting each brick a little bit in the horizontal plane so that the bricks meet, uh, uh, meet corner to corner instead of end to end. There is a sudden shout from the middle of the audience. That's called skintling. Okay. So, well, you know, I wouldn't put it past John to invent a word on the spot, but I looked it up and skintling means precisely what I had just described. And when I Googled the word, I got six hits. So what this means is that John was approximately one of six people in the entire world that knew what skintling meant and probably the only one who could come up with the word on the spur of the moment. So we will all miss, John will all miss that kind of erudition and I'm happy to pass on to the next person. Um, hi, this is Vicki. I think I'm up next. So um, it's hard for me to pick just one story about John, but I chose to tell you about the first time I met him. Um, I arrived at Princeton University Press in the spring of 2001. I was delighted to meet Diana Conway, who was a publicist for the math book program at Princeton. It was great to work with someone who knew the math community and how to market math books. 
We also had a lot of friends in common, most of them mathematicians. When I arrived, the biology editor had been handling the math book, so I thought it would be a good idea to check over the math manuscripts that were headed for production. There was one in particular that needed a little bit, or maybe a lot, of help. Um, I was able to handle most things, including changing moonlight conjecture back to moonshine conjecture. I think our biology editor didn't think that mathematicians had much fun, so they wouldn't know what moonshine was. There was one statement that uh, was attributed to John Conway that I didn't think could quite possibly be true. So it said that John could solve any configuration of Rubik's Cube in X seconds. I put in X because I couldn't actually remember how many seconds it was. And that seemed pretty amazing to me. So I asked Diana if she could confirm that with John. Well, she immediately said, you want to go ahead? Well, I'd never met John, so I was really excited. I was going to meet John Conway. So I got my stuff together, and I started to head out the back door of the press, heading down to Fine Hall. But Diana said, wait, he's in his downtown office. I didn't know there was a downtown math office, but I soon found out it was Small World Coffee. If you've been to Princeton, you know what that is and where that is. So when we arrived, I met John, and he suggested I go get some coffee. Oh, and yes, that I could get him a refill on my way. So we all sat down, and we were, were chatting, and I brought up my problem to John, that I wasn't sure that he could actually solve Rubik's Cube as the manuscript was claiming. And he said, no, that's not true. And he seemed a little bit annoyed. And then he said, I can do it much faster than that. And I thought, well, wow, how many seconds faster could he do it? And he told me he could do it three seconds faster. And so I said, oh, I am so sorry. I will make sure that that's corrected. And I was really, really scared. I thought that he would think was very incompetent and I would never see him again. So then he more calmly said, of course, there are other people who have broken my record. And then I more confidently said, well, this section in this book is about your accomplishments, so I'm not sure I need to mention those records. And then he just smiled. But from that time forward that we became really good friends, and I met John about once a month after that for over 18 years. We met at Small Worlds and at Fine Hall, either in the common room or in the hallway in an alcove where there was a blackboard and two chairs. This was convenient because we could chat with everyone who walked by. We never planned these meetings, they just happened. If I dropped by and he wasn't under the, he wasn't around, I'd leave a message or pick up one he left for me from his filing cabinet, which was really under the cushion of one of the chairs. We had amazing conversations about nothing that always led to something. They were about ideas for new books and how to explain some great math ideas to people who hated math or thought it was hard. We wanted them to fall in love with math. We talked about new math puzzles and gadgets we'd seen or heard about. Sometimes he talked and I cut colorful paper strips for him, which he could no longer do after he had his stroke. We made all kinds of things out of them and he hung them in his real office, which he never used. Some of them disappeared, and I don't know what he actually ever used them for. Maybe he just wanted me to keep busy. I'm not sure. After John could not always make it to Fine Hall, we would meet at the Equad, which is half the difference from his apartment to uh, Fine Hall. Or sometimes we'd meet in Small World Coffee that had just opened near his apartment. We would exchange papers that needed to be retrieved from or taken to his file cabinet in Fine Hall. We joked a lot about pretending to be secret agents. We weren't very successful, however, nor were we very secret because everyone knew where our secret, secret filing cabinet was. We had many adventures by plane, car, subway, taxi, and train, to all kinds of math meetings, MoMath many times, and local, middle, and high school. We had fun with people with our undergrad math club students and everyone else who came into the common room. He was my go-to guy for explanations about math, which were far beyond my math degree. He was truly one of a kind. Thank you, Vicki. Um, our next speaker is um, Paula Hildebrandt. Paul, are, are you here? Um, great. So, um, yeah, I, I, liked, I, like, I liked the reference to the filing cabinet. Um, 
Um, um, we have to ask Amina, who's coming up later, to tell us the story of how Conway invented the filing cabinet, he reinvented the filing cabinet. It's a, it's a great story. Um, I really just wanted to, to share John talking, uh, telling his own story. And Mark Pelletier is sort of the MC at this one. It's a, it's a meeting with Coxeter, and I tried to make a movie of this, and I'm hoping I can just turn it on for you. They were dedicating Mark's hyperdodecahedron to Coxeter at the Fields Institute. And I'm very grateful to Amina for sending me this video. And the second one says that ye being grounded, rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is breadth and length and depth and height. Now I can count, and that's four dimensions. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh yes, I should mention my Armenian friend, Paul Donchian, T-O-N-C-H-I-A-N. P.S. Donchian opens the door to a fairy land of pure science as wired and cardboard models explain highest mathematics. And if you look at the right, it says enthralls thousands of Chicago. But Einstein was barred from exhibit at fair, lest crowds crush him and models. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to step back 20 years, if I may, to Professor Cox for 75th birthday celebrations. Um, and I just want to tell you a little story. Um, there were, of course, all the people there <laughs> were students of Coxeter or grand students of Coxeter or maybe even great grand students of Coxeter. And they were all getting up saying how this man had been great inspiration in their lives. Um, well, I just, you know, rather brashly thought I'd do something different. And when I stood up, I said, I, I was here to forgive Professor Coxeter <laughs> um, for having tried to murder me. <laughs> and, and, and I don't which actually has um, some the truth about it. <laughs> um, a long, long time ago, Professor Coxeter came to Cambridge and gave a lecture. Um, and I didn't realize at the time that that was his attempt to murder me. He chose for his weapon something that Agatha Christie never thought of, a mathematical problem. <laughs> and um, uh, obviously, I mean, what actually happened, I walked out of the lecture room and crossed the main road in Cambridge, and just as I was in the middle of the road, the solution hit me. <laughs> and it wasn't the only thing that hit me. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. I guess that's it. It was nice to... Um, Nice to be a part of all this. You know? Nice to, and um, looking forward to, to to hearing what Amina has to say. Okay, Marjorie, you should be unmuted. I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank okay. you. Okay. So thank you so much for including me in this. It's really uh, wonderful to celebrate John and. Uh, I think that's the only way I can think about it without crying. So uh, I've been torn between telling you endless anecdotes and saying something more focused, and I decided to do both, uh, in, in, but in a very short amount of time. The anecdote I wanted to start with is, uh, is uh, when I first met him. And this was at a conference in the 1980s, and it was a conference, I think it was in France. And I had a bad cold of some sort, and I was sneezing through the entire thing. And at the end, it was a week long. At the end of the week, John come, came up to me to say goodbye. And he said, I shall always remember you with a red nose. <laughs> and I thought, oh, that's really funny. And then I didn't see him again for five years. And the first thing he said when he saw me again was, how's your cold? <laughs> so, so that to me would epitomize John's memory. Although, of course, we all know it was sometimes selective. But anyway, uh, what I want to talk about uh, is math. John is a member and a, a shaper of mathematical communities. So last week, as the news of John's death flew around the world, I received an email from an Iranian contributor to the Mathematical Intelligencer urging us to plan a special issue in his memory, and we're going to do that. Um, John, this correspondent said, was none such. And none such is exactly the right word. He was none such in many different ways. And one was his keen intuition of other people's feelings. Um, I remember a conference in Toronto, I think it was, and at the end of the afternoon session, we were all gathering around and ready to 
didn't know what to do. And one of the speakers who was notoriously full of himself turned to his chosen few and said, let's all go, let's go to dinner and leaving the rest of us standing there. And John instantly, who wasn't one of those few, instantly smiled his big smile at the rest of us and said cheerfully, yes, let's all go. And so off we happily went. And that to me was very, very characteristic of John is that he had a sense of how people were feeling and how to make people feel included and did it when, 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 the, when his opportunities arose. Um, and I think it was that intuition that made a real difference in an NSF program in the early 90s called the Regional Geometry Institutes or RGIs. And this was a proof of concept testing ground for what became the very successful Park City Mathematics Institutes. Um, the idea was to bridge the gulfs in the American mathematical community. And that's the gulfs between the university and college faculty on the one hand and high school teachers on another and college and graduate students on the third. And the bridge that we're trying to, to build there consists of bringing representatives of these three communities together for a whole month to focus on common mathematical themes. And somehow there was supposed to be the kind of interaction that would build, uh, make these bridges. Uh, and uh, so the, the, I was part of a group out here in Western Massachusetts of several different colleges that proposed to uh, have a geometry sessions and to do this and we got the grant and three of these RGIs were held in successive years at colleges here in Western Massachusetts. And they were run by thus, those of us who were on the, the, who had applied for the grant and I was one of them and I directed the third year. And the first two years, um, the bridges actually were one way with researchers graciously telling teachers what math really is and giving them a glimpse of its beauty. And in some ways they almost epitomized what the problem was, but nevertheless, you know, we tried to break that down. And finally, in the third year, we managed it. Uh, the three communities were one thinking together and building models together and exploring their properties. And at that time we thought, well, we've learned a lot from experience now, now we know how to bring these groups together. But then looking back at it, I think, no, that wasn't it. The difference was that John Conway was there in the third year and John was there and you can just imagine, I'll show you a picture that uh, if you can see that uh, he's there working at the dining table. Is it visible? Uh, and that was John, John was, um, yeah. And that's Charles Radin over here and Dora Schatzneider is over here and John Sullivan is here. Uh, they were part of the, some of the faculty that were also there. And John was very, very, very much the center of things and very, very active. And our theme that year was tilings and patterns and it was John's, John was in his element. Um, but the thing is that he didn't see three communities. He didn't have to build bridges. For him, this was all one. They made absolutely no distinction between the different groups or between what they knew, what they didn't know. For him, it was all an excitement to just investigate things and find out about them. And the models that we made were, by the way, his famous biprism. These were the convex version of the Einstein, a single aperiodic tile. And I'll show you a picture of that. Uh, these are photograph of these, if you can see that. These are single tiles that when fitted together can tile only aperiodically. And there had been a, a, a non-convex version before, but John managed to make a convex one. This was very exciting. And Doris Schatzneider, who was there, made a template for this or a net and we all cut them out. And you can imagine everybody all together, teachers, students, faculty, everybody, uh, excitingly making these things and putting them together and talking about their properties and how does it work and how does it not work. It really was a community activity in the most wonderful way. Uh, and this went on and on the whole time that John was there. It was one thing after another of ways in which everybody could get excited and could join together and really create something wonderful. Uh, and I think this was the proof of the concept uh, that John was the proof of the concept, the magic ingredient for this. And uh, never forgotten the wonderful way that he really, really drew everybody together. And it was because, not just because of the math that he was able to show them, but because his, his instinctive sympathy for everybody who was there and being able to pull them together. He was magnetism and his charm and his human in intuition. He was none such. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marjorie. Uh, next up is uh, Chamberlain Fong. Okay. In honor of Conway, I'm wearing a Lego hat with a Conway minifigure in there. And I've given him some uh, female companionship in the form of Marge Simpson and Princess Leia. And in the background, this is initials JHC. That's to honor Conway. And let me share my screen now. So I'm going to be giving a brief talk about 
uh, Conway's Doomsday Algorithm. Title of my talk is What Day of the Week Was Conway Born? His birthday, by the way, is December 26, 1937. So what is the Doomsday Algorithm? It's an algorithm invented by Conway for mental calculation of the day of the week. So your input is any date in the Gregorian calendar and the output would be any uh, the day of the week for that input date. And it could be done in your head without paper and pencil with practice, of course. Now, there have been many calendar algorithms. In fact, uh, the great mathematician Gauss came up with, has his own calendar algorithm. In 1887, Lewis Carroll came up with the first mental algorithm for calculating the day of the week of an input date in the Gregorian calendar. Yes, it's the same Lewis Carroll that wrote Alice in Wonderland. In May 1967, Martin Gardner found out about Lewis Carroll's algorithm and wrote about it in his Scientific American uh, column. And that's, this is what inspired Conway to come up with his own calendar algorithm. And now the, the, the days of the week are well behaved mathematically. You could think of them as isomorphic to the groups, the, to the integers, modulo seven. So at the core of Conway's algorithm is his on observation that certain memorable dates always fall on the same day of the week for any year. For example, uh, in here you have April 4, June 6, August 8, October 10, and December 12, 4, 4, 6, 6, 8, 8, 10, 10, 12, 12. They always fall on the same day of the week for any year. So for example, here in 2020, I've encircled these dates on the calendar and they're all on a Saturday. Conway also observed that the dates, uh, the dates 5, 9, 9, 5, 7, 11, and 11, 7 also fall on this same day of the week for any year. He called this day of the week doomsday, by the way. So it could, this could easily be remembered by the phrase working nine to five at the 7-Eleven. So for this year, here the dates are also encircled. You can see that they all fall on a Saturday. So Conway came up with this system for, once you know what this uh, doomsday is, or I, I would call it anchor date, you could figure out what the day of the week is for nearby dates. So he had, uh, a, here's a table for every day, uh, every month. So this year, this doomsday or anchor day always falls on a Saturday. In 1937, the year that he was born, they were all on a Sunday. So the gist of his algorithm is, uh, once you figure out that uh, December 12, 1937 is a Sunday, it's very easy to figure out the day of the week that his birthday was, was on. And uh, I, I, I wrote an article about this uh, doomsday algorithm in Scientific American that has more details because I only glossed over the details in this presentation. I'm gonna share it later. And I'd like to thank uh, do John Conway for coming up with this algorithm, which has given me lots of joy. Thank you, John Conway. Okay, Amina, you should be unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, everyone. Hi, Mina. Well, I wanted to thank Paul for taking all that video footage that he received yesterday. It's about 10 days worth of raw footage unedited to find what he actually wanted to find. So that's excellent. Thank you, Paul. Um, well, that happened to be the occasion that I first physically got to meet John Conway, which is at Donald Coxeter's house where we were allowed to look through books and letters and all kinds of things. And that's where John's character really came out. But a um, particular story I wanted to share was the director of the fields took all of us out to dinner to a very, very ritzy, fancy to do place. And after about four or five bottles of fine Canadian wine, we were rather tipsy and John happened to know that the moment was perfect. And he leaned over to Mark Pelletier and said, Mark, take off your shoelaces. At which point, Mark took off his shoelaces. And I wanted to kind of 
take a look at what John was doing over there because I had an interest in knots, mostly from uh, mountaineering, but I wanted to see what type of knot or not knot John was tying uh, Mark and him together with. And in the meantime, the director of the field was tying me and himself uh, together in a tie. So needless to say, I wasn't paying much attention. I was mostly engaged in looking at what, was, what John was doing. And then we both tried to get untangled. And I recall having to lift my leg over the feet, the director of the field's head to try and get untangled. And it was quite the uh, tipsy event. But that was sort of my beginning of my relationship with John. Um, it was in 2002 at the dedication of Mark's 120 cell at the Fields Institute, which, and I do believe the audio is available on the Fields website. Uh, Mark did an entire lecture on Paul Donch and the model builder, and where John gave that wonderful speech of how uh, Donald tried to murder him. So over the years, John and I would be engaged in trying to stump each other on puzzles and games. So uh, it was rather vexing. He usually have some type of puzzle for me to solve, and I, I also would bring him something rather interesting. I had hoped. Um, but there. Oh, and then the um, file cabinet story. Well, which should I do first? Well, the only puzzle that I can recall actually stumping John on is this one here, which is Byrenus Roloffs. And it is a dissection, helical dissection of the tetrahedron. And I was vexing him in for, during a Roger Penrose lecture at G4G. And John's hand would come in my lap as I would be twisting this thing and ask to basically see if he could play with it. And he would be engaged in trying to fiddle with this thing. And then he would get up and from the back of the room, argue with Roger Penrose in mid sentence, and then sit back down and try and solve the puzzle, which he actually did not solve. So I'm sure Renus was pleased with that. But um, uh, Paul asked me to say something about the filing cabinet. Well, one day John and I were talking about, oh, you know, how disorganized things can get with all these math things around. And he was saying that he had a brilliant idea. He discovered the filing cabinet. And then he realized that he had one in the corner of his office. So anyhow, I will let uh, the next person uh, speak if they would like. Um, I have too many stories I could keep going. So I'm sure I'd like to hear some other people's feedback and stories as well. Thank you, Amina. Thank you.